will start joining us as we proceed. So welcome everybody. My name is Fazel Moradi. I'm a visiting scholar at the University of Johannesburg and working from Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study. Um, this actual virtual symposium is a monthly event at, uh, at JIAS, abbreviation of Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study that we've been doing since May 2020. And um, it engages different topics. So it brings scholars from different parts of the world engaging different questions. Um, and today's um, gathering has to do with Daniel Schwartz's um, documentary film entitled Mirror Image. Um, we are going to start with Daniela um, and then to go, go come back to our discussant, Professor uh, Alida Asman and Professor Nadia Abulhaj. Uh, Daniela Schwartz is an interdisciplinary researcher, writer, and filmmaker residing in Israel. She's a certified permaculture designer and a leader of local initiatives concerning urban sustainability and community building in Tel Aviv. She studied literature at Tel Aviv University, cultural study at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and comparative literature at University of Chicago, as well as film uh, at Sam Spiegel Film and Television School. Her academic research focused on the cinematic representation of Palestinian ruins in Israel cinema and on other aspects of Israeli visual culture. Her uh, first documentary film, Mirror Image, won the Von Lee Award for Best Short Documentary Film at the Jerusalem Film Festival and Grand Jury Prize winner in short competition at uh, in New York City in 2014 and has been screened internationally. Um, Professor Alaid Esman is currently directing a research group at the University of Constance in Germany on the topic of civic strength. Um, Professor Esman has held the chair of English literature at, and literary theory at the University of Constance, um, also at the same university in Germany and taught as a guest professor at international universities, um, for example, Rice University, Princeton, Yale, Chicago, and Vienna. Her main, main areas of research include history of media, history and theory of reading, cultural memory, with a special emphasis on Holocaust and trauma. Together with her partner, um, Professor Jan Esman, who is also here with us, um, they have received uh, the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade in 2018. Among her many publications in both German and English um, are Shadows of Trauma, Memory and Politics and the Politics of Post-War Identity, published in 2016, and Is the Time Out of Joined on the Rise and Fall of the Modern Time Regimes in 2020. Nadia Abulhaj is Anne Whitney Olin, Olin Professor in the Departments of Anthropology at Barnard College at Columbia and Columbia University co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies and chair of the governing board of the Society of Fellows, Hyman Center for the Humanities, at, also at Columbia University. She also served as vice president, president and vice chair of the board at the Institute for Palestine Studies in Washington, DC in the United States, and is the recipient of numerous, numerous awards, including from the Social Science Research Council, the Harvard Academy for Area and International Studies, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the Hari Frank Guggenheim Foundation. Among Abulaj's publications are Facts on the Ground, Archaeological Practice, and Territorial Self-Fashioning in Israel Society published in 2001, and the genealogical science, the search for Jewish origins and the politics of epistemology in 2012. Her forthcoming book from with Verso examines the field of military psychiatry and explores the complex ethical and political 
implications of shifting psychiatric and public understanding of the trauma of American soldiers. Um, I welcome you all. And um, as I said, we are going to start with Daniela, taking 10 to up to 50 minutes to tell us a little about how, uh, about the production of the film and also the reception of the film in Israel, but also other parts of the world. And if you have any questions at this time as about the film, as Daniel is speaking, you can write your questions or you can raise your hand and I will allow you to share those questions immediately after Daniel is finished. Hello, thank you Fazil. And uh, thank you Nadia and Elida for coming. Um, I was really looking forward to this event. Um, yeah, so uh, the film was uh, made in 2013. Uh, actually, it, it started from uh, a writing um, course that I took and I wrote a short story. The title for the, it was an exercise about uh, writing a story about an object. And uh, I remembered the um, that that mirror and how I used to talk to my grandparents about it a lot and there was something uh, interesting about it and I wrote an imaginary dialogue with my grandparents about the mirror and after writing the story I felt like uh, the mirror is such a cinematic object that this story needs to become a film and I wasn't really sure why and what like I had this feeling that the mirror represents something or has some kind of met it's a metaphor for something but I didn't understand the metaphor for what and I think this was uh, something that um, was like a big enigma that maybe I didn't understand the answer to this question until I watched the film myself on the screen. <laughs> um, so it was it was like uh, really like walking into the unknown. It was some kind of a riddle that I was trying to solve. I was like, okay, mirror, maybe Lacan, mirror image, maybe it's Alice in Wonderland. I was like trying to think what, what is the, mean, the meaning of mirrors? What, what does this mirror represent? Why is it important that it's a mirror? It was clear to me that it's important that it's a mirror. Um, yeah, eventually, uh, so the film was not supposed to be this way. Um, all the time when I was working on it, my grandfather was always saying like, I don't understand what's interesting about this film. I really don't understand why you're making this film. There is no story here. There's nothing interesting. And uh, yeah, he was like willing to, to tell me everything, tell me all the story. And he was like, really, I don't see anything interesting about this. So I was like, okay, I'm not, go not going to make a film that the main character is saying that the story is not interesting. So uh, I plan to just uh, ma make the film more about myself and my position towards the mirror because it was obviously more complex than my, than my there was a conflict there, unlike uh, with my grandfather, according to what he said. So I plan to just shoot my grandfather, my grandparents' house and show like a lot of objects and artifacts around the house because it's a house that is really really crowded with elements and art and pictures and vessels and a lot of stuff and eventually finish with the mirror and look at myself through the mirror and tell the story of the mirror as, as i knew it and this is also what i shot and um, i was so excited in the shooting that that day i couldn't um, contain my excitement. So I wrote a post on Facebook to share the world with my excitement. And I wrote, finally, after eight years, because it took years from the idea to the shooting, I'm shooting this film about my grandparents' mirror about the, that was plundered in the Nakba. And I'm making uh, a film about it, finally. And uh, the, de the next day when I was sitting with the editor at the editing room and we were looking at the materials and really like, 
actually really frustrated because it was not interesting at all. And then my grandfather called and he was like, we heard about the post you wrote on Facebook. And I'm like, okay. And he said, so we wanted to know that we are no longer interested in participating, in cooperating with your film. And I was like, but why? We've been talking about this for years. I've interviewed him, I've recorded him, I, I talked to him about it. So why all of a sudden it's like, I'm, I told him, you said it's not even interesting. How come uh, all of a sudden you don't want to cooperate? And he said, I never said that I'm participating in a film about the Nakba. I never said that I'm um, participating, that I never said that this mirror was plundered. So for actually for years we were talking about this mirror, but I never noticed that all the time that we were talking, I was talking about one thing and he was talking about something else. And for me, like it was clear that, you know, 48, Nakba, it's the same thing or taken, plundered. I, it was clear to me that he, he's just using different words, but we are talking about exactly the same thing. So of course, when I write it in my words, he, he can translate it to his words. But his reaction to this post on Facebook made it clear to me that this is where the conflict is. So the conflict is really about the way you articulate this story. It's about this difference, such a slight difference that maybe doesn't seem, maybe doesn't seem, seem important, but it's, it's very important. So at that point I told him like, okay, so can we maybe have this conversation on video? And he was like, no, we're not having any conversation. We're not participating in the film at all. And it took a few more weeks of uh, persuasion and we had to uh, use all kinds of uh, techniques, including uh, bringing a two weeks old baby to the scene. And uh, eventually we, we talked about it and, this, and that's the film. So this is how the film grew. And it's funny because this initial conflict just recreates itself every time that there is a screening of the film, because every time I need to talk about the film, I also have to choose the words. And Fazil and I had the same uh, conflict when we were working on the invitation, because then we had to write, what is this film about? So, okay, so uh, this film is about a mirror that was uh, plundered in the Nakba, but but it's not, uh, or or it is, okay? But when I, for example, when the film was um, screened at Jerusalem Film Festival, I wrote, a, again, a post about it on Facebook and I wrote the film about, and I don't, I'm not even sure if it's me or someone else wrote, uh, and again, like nonchalantly, I wrote that it's a film about the mirror that was taken in the Nakba, because this is like the language that I speak with the people that are like in my milieu. And my family saw this post and was very, very upset uh, to the point that I got, uh, uh, most of my family until today uh, refuses to watch the film. They haven't even seen it. Um, because, you know, eventually, even though it's a 10 minute film and not two hours, eventually before seeing the film, people see a poster of the film or a post about the film. So they see a picture of my grandparents and I, we, we the, the short message eventually and so what what is it and it's it's my grandparents and it's a story about uh, Nakba and like my family doesn't want these things to come together like my grandmother says I don't want to be a part of this story I could take my grandparents and make a story about them about them being uh, Palma heroes being uh, pioneers being um, how my grandfather was as a 16 year old uh, boy was uh, saving uh, immigrants uh, uh, in the sea. Okay. But instead of telling those kind of stories, I'm, I'm telling a story that, that puts them in the last place they want to be. So um, for my family, it was a very, it is still very difficult to deal with it. To, at this point, we're just ignoring the film in, uh, in the family. So, uh, yeah, so it's always hard to talk about it because uh, it's a story, the film is about negotiation of narrative. And I think, it, um, I mean, basically, 
it is told from my point of view. I think um, we, we, we get to know the language and the vocabulary of my grandparents, but I think for me, there is kind of anthropological curiosity about this vocabulary, but I don't think that it's the, the it, they're not the subject that is like speaking in the film eventually. Um, so it's hard to put this uh, conflict into a one-liner because it's it's basically the film is about this uh, question of how to tell this story and about two voices at least that are negotiating this story. Yeah, and, and I say just one last thing that for me, baby, the what is important for me in this film is that. Um, it's really a very Israeli film. It's very Jewish. It's it's also very like it's very specific. You know, it's like this dialogue is inside the Ashkenazi uh, left in Israel, and so it's not we're used to having the question of narrative of the Nakba being a dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians negotiating the, the history and narrative. And somehow it was very important for me to, to, to show and to touch this conflict inside Israeli, uh, even, you know, the same class, the same ideological uh, milieu. And inside there, it's a very like small place, you find a very big conflict. So you can just imagine the weeds of this conflict when you look in a broader, uh, broader angle at, at, at points that are even further apart on the political map. The tension is so big and, uh, and I wanted to have this conversation with my grandparents that I'm so close to and that I love them so much because I didn't want this to turn into an accusation of like, okay, so there were these bad people that did something bad 70 years ago, and now we can expose the, the horrors that they did because they were bad people, because they are not bad people to me. They are the best people I know, and I love them. And I wanted to, to touch on this from this point of, of love and acceptance. This was something that was missing for me in, in films and cinema that I saw about this issue. Yeah. Just uh, just briefly, can, can you just say how it was received during the screening in Israel and outside? Yeah, there was a lot of there were a lot of screenings, so it's always different. It really depends on the on the crowd. Uh, if it's in uh, Israel, if it's uh, in Palestinian film festivals. Zionist audience, uh, non-Zionist audience, it's it's very different. I have um, opposing reactions. Some people say you are like a very common response is that I am uh, very hard towards my grandparents, that I put them in a very hard corner, that um, you can see their suffering, that you can see that even I was even accused that it's a kind of abuse um that I am uh, making them suffer. Um, and other people are like, yeah, you're not saying anything. actually, you're not uh, you, you're you're not uh, making any point. Uh, you're not going anywhere. So I, th I think for me actually the most interesting uh, discussions about the film war in a Palestinian film festival festival that I was in um, I, th I think it was in Ann Arbor Michigan and uh, apart from it, it was a very interesting situation to be the Israeli filmmaker in a Palestinian film festival and um, it felt very delicate and and then people asked me who cares about this mirror? Like, uh, why are you, if you care so much about this mirror, just uh, like break it or sell it or throw it away. Like, why are you making such a big deal out of this mirror? Because there are so, such worse things that happened than this story. Like, uh, 
who cares really we're talking about homes we're talking about deaths we're talking about um villages and and cities and like who cares about the mirror um but it was an opportunity for me to like to remember that really this is not a story about the palestinian nakba so this is why it's not a question of like how big and representative is this atrocity it's a it's a question of the the tensions inside the israeli narrative and israeli family and for that reason the this small um crime or maybe not a small event yeah that it's nothing big but still it brings so much tension and you can see how physically it affects the bodies of the people that are holding this story you can see that in their breath that how the weight of this story on their on their lungs you know so 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 for me and it's important and and it's important maybe it has more power than if it was a carpet or it was a house because of this metaphorical meaning of the mirror that uh, the question of of how we israelis see ourselves and our inability to look at the palestinians and to tell this the palestinian story because whenever we're trying to tell the story about the palestinians we find ourselves telling a story about ourselves but we don't want to see ourselves in this way so we can't see the palestinians because we are in the story of the palestinians and i remember when i was um a film student and I made a, a film about a, an old Palestinian woman that is coming to uh, Lifta, a depopulated Palestinian village next to Jerusalem, uh, to die. It was uh, like a three minute film that I was making in the first year and it was based on a scene from uh, Ranan Alexandrovich's uh, film I don't remember the name, but it's, he did a film about a tour that Palestinians do in Israel. And during this tour, there is an old man that stops the bus when they are traveling through Anabe. It's a documentary. It's a real story, like a 90 year old man. And he asks the bus driver to stop and he goes down and he visits uh, the grave of his grandfather and his father. And then the group wants to live and he doesn't want to live with them. He tells them, you go without me. I'm staying here. <laughs> and so uh, I it, like, like, okay, I'm going to die soon. So I want to die here next to the graves of my ancestors. So I did a small, uh, a short uh, scene of an old woman coming to Lifta and just staying there to live between the, the, gr the grass. And I showed it to my grandmother, the same one from the film. And she saw the film and she said, this is such a beautiful movie. Um, it really touches me because my mother was also an immigrant. And I know this pain of being away from your, from your homeland. So when she was watching this story and this story had nothing to do with her, it was absolutely possible for her to show empathy. Um, and the problem starts when the finger points at them being the reason for this misery. So, yeah, so we're like entangled in this maze of mirrors that we cannot see the other without seeing ourselves. This is something that I, and, and this also came uh, to work while I was making the film because, you know, in the last scene of the film, we are reading the story and the sh and the and the scene is shot through the mirror and i remember that i showed it to people and a lot of people didn't notice that it was shot through the mirror because actually a mirror is something that you cannot see you just see the reflection through the mirror so you have to um see the 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 the, the context of the mirror in order to understand that what you're looking at is a reflection and not the thing itself. Thank you, Daniel. We, we, we're coming back uh, with more questions. Um, Professor Asman, do you hear me? 
Yes, I do. Please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much for these uh, really <laughs> enlightening um, uh, opening remarks. So they have added um, a huge new dimension for me uh, for the film. What I will do is just ask a few questions. And the first question is, how did I come to know about the film? My contact with Danielle uh, dates back to a meeting in Chicago at Chicago University. I think it was in 2015. And uh, there I gave a lecture and the topic was important on forms of forgetting. And um, <clears throat> this was for doctoral students in a brown bag format lunch. Yeah, this is where we met for the first time. And I had been invited by Antje Postema, a doctoral student herself in the Slavic department, working on Srebrenica. She announced um, now for her friends and other <clears throat> students a time slot at the university for a mixed group of doctoral students coming from various departments and countries. <clears throat> and in this a group of, I think, about 10 female, mostly female participants, I met Danielle for the first time. She told us that at the time she was not writing an um, academic dissertation, but I'm interested to hear that you did it in another context, but that you had been working on a film for almost 10 years, maybe you said eight years then. And, um, and it would have the length of 10 minutes. I mean, working for 10 years on a film on 10 minutes, that impressed us immensely. And we, it made us very curious. And I was delighted then to learn more <clears throat> about it in then our continuing email contact. And I finally received also a link um, to the film when it was finished and it went on tour at various um, festivals. And what I learned was that it was very successful as a festival film. And uh, I find it now very important to learn that it was not successful in your family which is a very important <laughs> additional uh, comment. Now, the question, uh, second question I want to ask is why was I fascinated uh, with this film? Now, my approach to cultural memory, which I have pursued over decades uh, together with my um, husband, Jan, is a dual one. I focus not only on how individuals and societies remember, but also include the question, how do they forget? Because for me, um, memory always involves the two operations, remembering and forgetting. And you cannot really focus on the one without um, also thinking about the other. Uh, this, of course, demands a totally new, different methodology and involves a new kind of discourse. Um, <clears throat> what has effectively been forgotten has, of course, become invisible and unreachable. But I think we can study practices and processes of either <clears throat> going into oblivion, like processes of covering up and processes of uncovering. So in this context, I'm particularly interested in the ways in which a shameful past that is publicly unacknowledged and <clears throat> has become what I call silent history resurfaces in this case in a family memory conversation. In many cases, it is the third generation that brings up uh, <clears throat> after long uh, silences, topics, and addresses them uh, with a new interest. Um, in Israel, this third generation has grown up now in a safe distance from either the heroic or traumatic events of the past of 48. And due to this changed historical, these circumstances and and due to access to new historical research and information, they start to rise and also <clears throat> information from the outside of the country. Um, they raise their voices in the society to mark questions and issues that had been dropped from consciousness and public discourse. Um, now in March, 2011, uh, the Israeli Knesset passed a Nakba law that prescribed forgetting in public discourse in that it explicitly criminalized the memory of the expulsion of Palestinians in the War of Independence 48. The political statement was very clear. The heroic moment of founding the new 
state and nation <clears throat> in this war of liberation is a mobilizing national narrative that must not be tainted <clears throat> by non-heroic episodes having to do with the expulsion of the defeated. Daniel has found a very special entry into this tabooed subject. It is an object, <clears throat> namely the mirror and its history, which opens up a door into the tabooed past and creates a common project. I call it a common project, the collective reconstruction of an untold story with the words that all can agree upon. The film records an interview of the filmmaker, Danielle, with her grandparents in which she appears in flexible and changing roles as a detective, historian, lawyer, and grandchild participating in this collective transgenerational effort to solve the mystery, and I would like to pick up this term mystery here, of the origin of a huge mirror that is such a prominent element among the furniture of in her grandparents' apartment home. Now, one thing is clear, the mirror is not a heirloom. The grandparents who had to flee Europe as young people and came to Palestine in the early 1930s obviously did not have any large pieces of furniture in their luggage. When asked by <clears throat> uh, his granddaughter about this mirror as part of a staged and formal inquisition, the grandfather tells the story of this mirror as a find in the Palestinian village of Zak Luka, which he reached in 48 without giving further details. We also learn from the grandfather that he grew up as a child near a Palestinian farm where he enjoyed spending time and playing with the animals and children. In Danielle's film, the conversation about the mirror develops into a remarkable communication about the family secret of the entire nation. In this cross-generational exchange, grandchildren and grandparents strive together to find a common language to arrive at a shared vision together, <clears throat> a shared <clears throat> vision of a tabooed history. Was the mirror acquired legally after the war or was it looted? Words like rob, loot, take, plunder, buy, are tried out as parallel versions of a possible narrative. Take sounds like plunder, <clears throat> intervenes the grandmother, and she adds, we can't deny the thing, but we had nothing to do with it. The film carefully registers the process of bringing back a silent history <clears throat> by reintroducing a story into the family memory. And in doing so, it registers very carefully the flows and eddies of emotions. Its genuine achievement lies for me in the fact that this seemingly trivial and yet extraordinary memory work um, with its serious search for truth is carried out not in a spirit of harsh reproach and accusation, you just mentioned it, but in a frame of family intimacy, of love, respect, and loyalty. Uh, third question, what can be the effect of this film? The film can be described as a low key intervention. It addresses a highly political and politicized topic in a private and protected family communication. My question is whether we can discover in this film a new interest and strategy in dealing with the past experimenting with new forms of remembering. As private family memory made public in the film, it is a part of public history, a term that became popular around 2010 to indicate a growing interest among people of various <clears throat> age to engage with their history in a non-professional way. Public <clears throat> memory, has many facets and motivations, but it is certainly an important approach towards engaging with national narratives in a democratic way. There seems to be a growing interest in one's recent history and a rising demand to discuss and challenge monological national narratives 
by entering into a more dialogical discussion about it, about them. There is also a growing agreement that this requires the willingness of Palestinians to learn about the Holocaust as it requires the willingness of Jews to learn about the Nakba. By bringing the two perspectives on the traumatic history of violence closer together, a more inclusive account of what happened could be achieved <clears throat> that could be the basis for shared commemorations and a more peaceful future. And this, of course, is not in the indicative, but all in the subjective, in the possibility that could be created by such a memory. Last point I call repairing the past. Traumatic events in history have left wounds and scars that cannot heal. But this must not mean that mutual forgetting must be the result that leads to further explosions of hatred and violence. The past cannot be restored, but it can be repaired. Building up mutual trust among former enemies is the only effective prevention of war that can help to pacify both sides and interrupt the vicious cycle of mutual aggression. In this case, effect has also to do with affect. Remembering history involves emotions, which need not be changed, but can be expanded. And here I refer to what you said about your uh, grandmother about empathy. Where is empathy possible and where is it impossible? Seeing one's history also from the point of view of the other opens up an important resource, <clears throat> namely that of empathy. Um, acknowledging and recognizing the experience of the other is the starting point for shared projects and the building of a common future. And the problem is, why is this empathy obstructed? Because <clears throat> you are <clears throat> playing a role that you don't want to play in the, the story that you are seeing. As um, uh, I quote another person writing in um, 2018 review, anyone who observes the now 70 year old Arab Israeli conflict will quickly be convinced that it will remain unresolved as long as the respective parties do not recognize each other fully without reservation. Now this can be done without <clears throat> recognizing this cannot be done without recognizing their respective histories. Danielle Schwarz's film could be an intervention in private memory and public history to make the national narrative more complex and inclusive. This, however, requires a willingness, context, a context of willingness to pick up the story of the film and accept the conservation, uh, conversation about the mirror as an invitation to look for similar and other stories starting a public debate <clears throat> and discussion about the ways in which this shared past could be remembered together. Hitherto, this debate has started in the public realm, in the NGO, Zohot, and the events that it creates, of which the last one was a shared commemoration of Israelis and Palestinians of the Nakba. Up to 100 visitors took part in commemorative events and excursions. Israeli Jews and Palestinians meet during these tours. And in this way, personal contacts are established and the rather segregated society and knowledge about the Nakba has a chance to spread in the society. These are definitely remarkable steps, but the question remains how to integrate this commemorative work, for instance, of the group Sochot, into a larger political project. How can these activities pave the way for a more self-critical historical knowledge and initiate mental, social, and political change? I would say this is a really promising start, and I can only <clears throat> gesture in the direction in which this all uh, could lead if it were not obstructed. So it's a promising start indeed, but here lies also a problem. If the shared memory remains enclosed in small circles, if, we cannot, if it cannot find its way into the larger Israeli society and is, taken, is not taken up in schools or universities and finally parliament and other institutions of its democracy, this memory remains inactive 
and stays forgotten, silent history. But circling and discuss, discussing this topic in an act two virtual symposium as ours, together with critical thinkers in all fields of knowledge and memory practice and for, from around the world, <clears throat> who are here now today participating in caring, sharing and circulating knowledge is, I would emphasize, is a promising step. And I would like to end by saying that I'm very honored and grateful to be included in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, to tell Sia Tokosa that we will come back to your questions once uh, this session is over. So there is a question di directly to you, Elida, and to two questions to you, Elida, and one question to you, Daniel, just to think about, you can read it. And we can we come back to that later. Professor Abulaj, can listen to you now. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for including me in this. So I'm gonna come at this um, in a slightly odd angle perhaps because it really um, sort of resonated with uh, a whole question about history and, and what it's for and memory in the archive that I've been struggling with anyway. So I should start by saying, I think it's, it, it's kind of an amazing interchange and I was I'm glad you told the story Danielle about how this came to be and be screened because I kept thinking how did this get screened like how did your grandparents how did they feel about that but okay so let me um begin and let me just say one more thing as an aside because you were talking about being at the Michigan Film Festival or the Palestinian Film Festival in Michigan and why the mirror and maybe it's the anthropologist in me but I love that you could take this small object and kind of open up this larger story. So, um, so what is the film about in sort of my reading of it? And I'm gonna do my own reading through a kind of recent set of talks I've given and something I'm kind of working on writing, which is really thinking about Palestine, the archive and the struggle over history. Um, not so much what happened in 1948 as in the Nakba, but more so what is historical knowledge of the Nakba for? I've wondered, or what do we, and in this sense, since I largely mean Palestinians, but even sort of kind of left-wing, a lot of left-wing uh, uh, Israeli Jews and historians in particular, what do we think, what do we expect it to do? And in some sense, it's the question of what is the role of uncovering in Aleida's words. The film mirror image speaks to a set of questions, perhaps inadvertently, that I've been asking in part perhaps by complicating them, how do you tell the story? So let me begin with a general description of the promise, what I've referred to in other places as the promises, and in fact, perhaps the perils or failures of the archive. Writing in the mid 1980s, Edward Said responded to the 82 invasion of Lebanon and to the ways in which Israel's narrative about self-defense and a purity of arms survived that war to retain a stronghold over the American public conversations, a conversation in foreign policy. Facts, he argued, do not stand on their own. They require narratives. And quote, the Palestinians have not yet gained the permission to narrate, unquote. In closing, he suggested, and I quote again, each of these two communities, in other words, Israelis and Palestinians, is interested in its origins, its history of suffering, its need to survive, to recognize these imperatives of components of national identity and to try and reconcile them strikes me as the task at hand, unquote. I do wanna say, and maybe this relates to the previous comments by Aleda, I sometimes worry about, or I, I've long wondered about the possibility of that reconciliation anyway, because I mean, as anthropologists, we think a lot about, well, I don't, but climate classic anthropology thinks a lot about in cultural incommensurabilities. But I often also think we don't think seriously about political incommensurabilities, but I'm gonna leave that aside. So the question of the Nekba, what happened, who left, why they left, who took what, who came back, why they came back, why they couldn't come back. To paraphrase Danielle's grandfather's set of comments, although he's largely talking about the mirror, that has long stood at the center of that permission to narrate. The Nekba, although not, no longer understood or referred to by Pal Palestinians as a singular event, but rather as an ongoing structure of destruction and seizure is after all the original sin so to speak. 
As such, for decades, Palestinian, the Palestinian struggle over narration centered around insisting that in fact, Palestinians were expelled during the war. And what's more that it was no accident for the Jewish state to be founded, ethnic, the ethnic cleansing, although that's a going back with a term today, the ethnic, ethnic cleansing of the land's non-Jewish inhabitants had to be accomplished. Among Palestinians and within the Arab world more generally, the history of the Nakba was known, spoken about, remembered and written about in the years and decades immediately following 1948. In the Palestinian historian Faya Sayyid's words written in 1965, unquote, to quote, the Zionist ideal of racial self-segregation demands with equal imperativeness, the departure of all Jews from their lands of exile and the eviction of non-Jews from the land of Jewish destination, namely Palestine. Both he wrote are essential conditions of Zionist fulfillment and Jewish national redemption, unquote. And yet such narratives that history were not accepted as true, except in perhaps in rare instances in the Euro-American world for decades, let alone in Israel. As Danielle's grandmother insists in one fundamental moment of erasure, which she repeats a few times in different moments, in different ways, quote, in those days, we didn't say Palestinian, we said Arabs, and that makes a big difference. Let me leap forward to the 1970s, late 1970s. With the Israeli state's declassification of the, in 1978 of documents pertaining to Israel's so-called War of Independence, the facts, the authorized facts about 1948, that is, would begin to shift. Israeli historians gained access to previously unavailable documents to what had been state secrets, and a few began to rewrite the history of their state. To paraphrase Ariela Azulay's analysis of imperial citizenship, that's her term, and the archive, the variability of Israeli historians and not Palestinians who had been either read, rendered exiles or second-class citizens or subjects under occupation. Um, the, access, the variability of Israeli historians to access those archives speaks precisely to the privilege of imperial citizenship upon which um, their lives depend. On the basis of this newly available documentary evidence, however, housed in Israeli state archives, some historians challenged Israeli historians challenged hegemonic narratives regarding its founding. Uh, figures such as Benny Morris and Ilan Fape, to name two very different figures, argued that Palestinians were driven out, expelled by Zionist military forces during the war. There were disagreements about these so-called new historians and on the part of Palestinian scholars who challenged them. Was the expulsion intentional, pre-planned, essential to the establishment of the state? Was it an event that unfolded during the chaos or fog of war? Despite those not insignificant disagreements, however, the basic parameters of that new history, new from a certain perspective, became widely accepted in the Israeli academy and perhaps even in the Israeli public domain. During its so-called war of independence, Zionist brigades drove out most of the land's Palestinian population. The founding of the Jewish state instead required their expulsion. By the mid 80s, this so-called post-Zionist scholarship seemed to portend a promise. And this goes back to the question of what is history for or imagined to be for. The facts were out there, archival evidence now in the hands of Israeli historians, i.e. more reliable ones, demonstrated what Palestinians already knew and had long written and said. Post-Zionism was emerging as a term and a politics. The first intifada was unfolding on the ground. And there was a cautious optimism in the air, at least early on, that a political solution imagined at the time as a two-state solution would be achieved. Might a Palestinian historical narrative become widely intelligible, more authoritative? Might it have permission to be narrated in Saeed's terms? Might the facts on the ground actually change? Were we at a turning point in the Palestinian struggle against the settler state? From today's perspective, one certainly has to wonder about that promise or optimism. There are too many reasons to even, to, to even begin to give a comprehensive account of how we got to where we are today, politically that is. A state far more squarely on the right, justice for the destruction of Palestine, the ongoing seizure of land, war and occupation, let alone exile, has probably never seemed as far off today as it does today since the years immediately following 1948. But I wanna focus on a very specific question, the promise of history, that earlier promise in some sense, and its relationship to the promise of justice. Within the terms of what the historian Jones Scott has called the judgment of history, that is, quote, an abiding faith, at least for the general public, if 
if not for all professional historians, that in the end, we will be vindicated by history, that truth will eventually be recognized, unquote. As post-structuralist as we may all be, perhaps many of us hold on to some more classic, if unarticulated conception of the facts of the matter and their political implications, at least where history is concerned. There was always a political com common sense, sometimes explicit a la Edward Said, sometimes not, that if the Nakba narrative were to be heard, if it were given permission to be narrated, it might actually make a political difference in the real world. And yet, what if knowing has no relationship to justice here? To summarize an argument I've made at length elsewhere, the Nakba, even when known and spoken of, seems to me to remain what Rolf Trio described as an impossible history. He was talking about Haiti. Its political implications are impossible to grasp or to realize. In short, even when the facts are out, they are no recognition of their ethical or political significance. And as such, no political consequences have followed suit. And I just want to say that one can describe this quite blatantly and easily to the settler movement, who's like, Yes, the Nakba, and we're going to do it again. But, and, and that that position can't plausibly just be described as a post-truth or alternative facts sensibility, as so much of the conversation about the rise and power of the radical right today has been framed. There is, amongst settlers, people in Sheikh Jarrah, et cetera, more of what I would call an embrace of the Nakba as necessary and ongoing for the very survival and future of the Jewish state. It would be too facile, however, to hide behind the radical right here in thinking about the politics of the Nakba in Israeli society, and for that matter, among the Zionist diaspora, for lack of a better word, today. Even to take Benny Morris, by the early 2000s, he'd return, move from a reluctant post-Zionist to a staunch defender of 48. All nations are founded in violence. Israel is no exception. It had to be done. So let me turn to the film, finally. A powerful and sometimes painful conversation between Danielle and her grandparents, which I think complicates this larger argument I've made elsewhere in interesting ways. Although I'm not convinced undermines it, but that might be me. What might it mean to know the Nakba? Language, of course, matters immensely here. Arabs, not Palestinians. The grandmother reminds Danielle a number of times, taken, not plundered. The latter seems too harsh, the former softer. Or as Danielle's grandfather notes at one point, he compromised on the word taken because it can imply that the mirror was bought. Although I'm not so sure about this, that semantic slippage, at least not in English. And I, my Hebrew isn't good enough to know about semantic slippage at that level. The grandmother insists on the importance that her, uh, her husband jumped the fence to play not with just with the livestock, but with the children, right? The Arab children painting a picture perhaps of a time when all was fine. So much of the narration in the film, it strikes me, is about a kind of liberal self-fashioning, which Danielle, I think you talked about really nicely here. It's about Israeli, an Israeli struggle about the Israeli self, certain class, right? We would not have taken something that does not belong to us. Neither would Danielle's great grandfather have done so. And then the caveat. They are not like us. And that's an important slippage, I think, in the text. That is presumably a collective Israeli us here, not just a familial one. In Danielle grandma, Danielle's grandmother's words, she is, quote, not justifying people who took things, unquote. She is, quote, explicitly not saying that, not forgiving, but seeing it differently. There are people who are not like us, and that's what happens in wartime, unquote. As both insist over and over again, they don't want to be part of a story of plunder. But it's not just that they don't want to be, it seems that they are not. It isn't just that it's too harsh a word. It's also that, quote, this isn't about us. They have the mirror because of something, and I love this wording, happened to the mirror, right? We had nothing to do with it, the grandmother says. This can't be, in other words, who we are. Um, And as Danielle noted in opening, how we Israelis see ourselves 
not me, obviously, I was rarely see themselves. One can't tell any story about Palestinians without telling a story about oneself, right? And that's obviously entirely entangled here. More generally in this encounter between Danielle and her grandparents, there's the repeated question of why tell the story at all? The conquests of Zarnaka. What, what does it have to do with the story of the mirror? The grandfather's unconvinced. Why include it, right? He says, quote, I don't see why you have to delve into it so much, but I find the grandmother's response far more interesting. Quote, it's written in the history books, so it's not a big deal, unquote. In other words, there are no real secrets here, right? In his book, The Theater of Operations, the anthropologist Joe Masco explores the reconfiguration of the US security state in an era defined by the threat for the, of and the war on terror. He argues about the impact of an expansive state secrecy. In other words, the question of post-19, sorry, post-9-11, the US state started reclassifying all sorts of art documents from the Cold War that had been declassified, including ones that you could still download on the web, but they were reclassified. Um, so he follows this question of the federal government removing so many previously declassified Cold War security documents from the public domain now reclassified or more often categorized as sensitive but unclassified. What work does secrecy do, he asks, especially in a context in which many of these same documents are already available, like they've been downloaded. Drawing on Jody Dean's work, he argues, quote, the recognition of state secrecy and the accompanying, accompanying conspiratorial subtext to everyday life that it engenders functions today to block political participation and curtail the possibility of truly democratic endeavors. The national security state system, I'm still quoting, of compartmentalized secrecy produces a world in which knowledge is already rendered suspect, unquote. In other words, what don't I know? To extend Masco's analysis beyond state secrecy, as Danielle asked her grandparents, why hide things? Why not talk about things, unquote? In other words, what does the work of quotidian secrecy do? Danielle seems to be asking. Although I think we're still stuck left with the question of what don't I actually know? Is the problem, has it ever been even in Israel, one of what I don't know? Are there things really not known that need to be uncovered? Do Israelis not know enough? It's a question I've asked in my recent book about the US and the wars, right? The whole logic of WikiLeaks dumps is that there's so much state secrecy that citizens of democratic states, in this instance, the US vis-a-vis -vis the war in Iraq and other wars, if they really knew, right, it would make a difference. But don't they know enough? As with Danielle's grandparents, the generation of 1948 certainly knew what happened. They knew what they did even if they have fully, they have chosen not, to, not often to speak about it, or if they have chosen to frame it in more palatable ways to themselves and not just to the world. And when they did speak about it, what words do they choose? Plunder versus taken, Arab versus Palestinian. But I think the bigger question is, was the Nakba ever a story not known among Israeli Jews? Perhaps it was at best a public secret, known if not spoken of, at least not in public, but the generation of 48 certainly knew more than enough as do Israelis today. The question there then is the, is the problem one of uncovering and remarrying, or is there a different ideological problem here? And I wanna think frame this as the problem of disavowal, which I think the film actually captures in interesting ways. To draw on Lisa Udine's felicitous description of disavowal, and she's actually, it's a book about Syria. Quote, disavowal, quote, goes beyond denial in that the problem calling for judgment is posed, unquote. In other words, the war of 1948, the expulsion. How is it to be judged? In fact, today it is spoken of, the Nakba, often by Israeli historians, by Israeli journalists, that recall Ali Shavit's book, My Promised Land, by settlers on the streets, and even by Danielle's grandparents who know it, but, but insist both on softer language and on the fact that it has nothing to do with us. Let me go back to Lisa's words, Lisa Weedine's words. In disavowal, 
the power of ideology comes into especially bold relief with subjects hailed into a position where the realities can no longer be denied, but they can still be dismissed, unquote. The Nakba, in other words, no longer even needs to be denied, contrary perhaps to Saeed's reading on the significance and promise of the power of narration. And I'm going back to quoting Lisa Wedeen, quote, undergirded by investments that prove sticky, <coughs> even in the face of knowing better, unquote, in this, in this instant, an investment in the virtue of a Jewish state and the political attachment to Zionism, and I will quote again, um, undergirded by investments that prove sticky even in the face of knowing better is reflected in and generated anew through ordinary moments of disavowal in the I know very well, yet nevertheless, rationalizations that allow us to participate in and uphold existing orders, unquote. Israel was founded on the violence of conquest and expulsion and massacres of its Palestinian inhabitants and in living memory. And yet if the Jewish state was to be born, there was no other choice. This was what happened. This is what happens in war. In this case, the plunder of the mirror. We know we may not always talk about it in public amongst ourselves, but we do know. And yet the existing order, the Jewish state in some form of another needs to be upheld nevertheless. So basically the, I, I think it captures this complex question about whether we're living in a political reality in which a lot of the kind of commitments of a moment of both anti-colonial movements and a lot of post-colonial scholarship that begins in the 80s and 90s, but I also think it exists among, I know, Palestinian activists, that knowing somehow, well, there are two things, so to just summarize this, that one, that this is about secrets and things unknown, and I'm unconvinced, like one may not know all the details, but certainly we all know enough. But it's second, that if one knew, it would actually make a difference. There are ways of remaining attached to this que the question of disavowal, where one can know and yet nevertheless remain attached to the forms of the state. And in fact, I think that's, Danielle, what you were talking about, there's the extent to which you say it is a conversation amongst Israelis that can never exclude, that always entails Palestinians. I think that's right. But I also wonder sometimes whether that conversation can also just remain within the realm of who are we and how do we remain virtuous or at least liberal subjects, not like them, and yet admit what we've done so that it's much more of a conversation about self-fashioning than about politics in the real world, which is not what I'm accusing of you of doing in the film, but that you may be capturing something about that. Okay, I will stop there, thank you. I just, uh, can you maybe just uh, re re repeat the last sentence, explain again what you said in that last sentence that- um... Okay, um, hold on. Uh, yes, I stupidly just shut the document. Um, so the last sentence is, um, sorry. You're saying that uh, you're hoping for a for a discussion that is not so much busy with self-fashioning and more uh, with politics, or well, no, I'm just saying that I that I think that, and I, again, I let me just say this sort of when I think about sort of Palestinian scholarship and the work of historians and activists, et cetera, that so much of this struggle has been bringing to consciousness the fact of the Nakba, right? not just its ongoing nature, but what happened in 1948, right? And yet I think what's become clear over the last 20 years is that one can know, I mean, let's just say the Euro-American world can know what happened in 1948, as can Israeli citizens across the political spectrum. And it can still have no political import in the sense of requiring a politics of justice or repair. That's what's being captured in this notion of disavowal. I know very, I know very well that the founding of the state required expelling the vast majority of its Palestinian inhabitants. I may even feel bad about it. I may worry about what it says about who I am. So I have to deny that's not really who I am. 
but I remain attached to having a Jewish state enough, enough that, and it's, it's Manoni's words. I know it's a different reading of ideology. It's not that when ideology, suddenly the truth will be revealed behind ideology, but rather you can know, you can know what needs to be judged. That is, was the Nakba a crime? But one can set that aside and say, I know, but nevertheless, the value of having a Jewish state overrides the significance of that crime, right? Whereas for a long time, I think the assumption was, the problem was that people didn't recognize what had happened in 48. I think those, those proposed different kinds of political problems and the assumption that somehow if we could all come to consciousness or recognize 48, it would make a political difference. I am no longer convinced. I think we're at a very different political moment um, than the 70s, where it was much more common to say Palestinians were not expelled, 48 didn't happen, right? But politically, that hasn't really made a difference. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm, thank you, uh, Nadia. And can I just say one thing? And I'm just saying your film made me also think about that again in a different way, because it's also about language. It's about what does it mean to know, but what's going on in this dynamic, I think is very complex. Yeah, sorry. Um, so obviously um, people who reacted to you saying that the white care about the mirror, they don't know that the mirror cares. And as you heard, um, yeah, touching or speaking about the mirror is entering an infinite field of, yeah, um, contested knowledge or knowledge or history or politics or state. And the most uh, interesting um, issue here is obviously the mirror has been there for a while and it is because of the film that we are now here and uh, can have a conversation about it. So if you could just uh, briefly engage with uh, with what Aleda and uh, Nadia um, shared with us, and then we can just uh, start with the you know, open conversation and I invite everybody here to either write your question and I read it, or you just, uh, yeah, just um, turn on your mic and uh, camera so we can see you and hear you. So just uh, briefly, if you could do that, Daniel. Yes, yeah, so um, I want to, first of all, uh, thank you both, uh, Raida and uh, Nadia. What you said uh, reminded me of things that are important to me. Um, uh, one of them is uh, what Raida said about how um, we, wa ways of forgetting and what does it mean to forget. And I think for me, the question of the Nakba I, mean, I I grew up in a very uh, Zionist atmosphere. Uh, I, I was uh, very much in, involved in the Zionist ethos, uh, and I wanted to take part of it. And it was what I considered as, as beautiful and true and good. And then in my 20s, when I started uh, to, to learn, and, and yes, it, it did, it, yes, it did come through the prism of knowledge, uh, starting to learn about the occupation, uh, something that I didn't know about, or what are, what is Palestinians? What, what, what does this word mean? As a, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and there was constant, uh, intifada, bombing, danger, and still I was not, I had no idea why, why is this happening? Like there was no logic. And I remember asking my mother, why, but why are they, uh, why are they killing us? And she said, yeah, they hate us. Yeah. So this was the story. And only when I was in my twenties, I started to learn the facts. So it did go through knowledge. Um, um, yeah, but I think the film does show that there is a limit to that because like you said, Nadia, we agree about the facts. There is nothing in the film that like we're, there is no disagreement about facts. There is no new fact brought forward. It's not like an investigation 
Yeah, we learned that this happened. Uh, we uncovered a new uh, a new fact. No, we, we agree about the fact. It's only the question of how of how we say it. Um, and then I was like, when I when I was making the film, um, a friend that was helping me was asking. We we realized it's going to be a short film, and she said, if the film was just one image, what would be the image? And the image for me was my grandparents sitting and eating in the dining room and the mirror is in the background. It's always there. They are living their lives, their quiet lives in the house and the mirror is always there. And I think this is why for me this became like an image of the, the presence of the Nakba in Israeli life that we are living in our home and our peaceful, our safe life and it's just always there. So it's not hidden in the basement. It's not covered with a blanket. It's not a secret in the sense that it's something that is hidden. Uh, it's a secret in the sense that no one is talking about it, but it's always there. It has a very strong present. It's like the background and the scenery of everything. So for me, this was a question of re-understanding what does it mean, secret? Uh, because I always thought about secret as something that we are not talking about. And like Elida said, in order to forget, you are, have to, set, to tell a different story in a sense. So it turned out that a secret can actually be something that we talk about a lot. But the question is, how do we talk about it? Um, one of the most interesting researchers about this was uh, Noga Kadman's uh, research about um, depopulated Palestinian villages in Israel and how they are represented in, uh, you know, signs that are put there by, um, sorry, I don't know how to say it in English, but like institutions for visitor, for tourists. So what is said in the sign? Something is said. So Israelis are really used to living around remnants of Palestinian uh, civilization in forests, in, in cities, but we always have someone mitigating uh, the encounter with these remnants and giving them a different meaning. And, and this is how this is kept a secret. So it's not like all the remnants are hidden. They are there, but we tell something else about them. So we call them archaeological remnants, or we call them, yeah, it's like old crusaders building, or it's an Ottoman architecture, or maybe you can have a sign even telling about the, um, the heroes that conquered this village uh, in the War of Independence. So there is a story about this. It's just not that story, the story of the Nakba. And this is actually how Fazil and I uh, met each other um, when I was uh, presenting my MA research that was about uh, images of Palestinian ruins in Israeli cinema. So I was taking Noga Kadman's research about the, those remnants in real life and I wanted to see how these remnants are shown in, in the cinema because I wanted to, to see how Israeli films present the Nakba. And it turned out that there are a lot of films that show Palestinian ruins and still it is not films about the Nakba. So, uh, so what are they about? This was uh, the question of the, there is another story that is kind of smothered over the original historical story. Um, and and the, another thing that I wanted to say is about this concept of disavowal, uh, that for me it came as a um, as a mirror image of the concept that uh, that resonated a lot for me in this discussion, which is the concept of validation. Uh, in the last few years, I'm very um, occupied with the question of trauma, uh, and um, not only from the political aspect, but also on a private, personal um, level. And these two levels are very much entangled for me. And I really experience my personal, emotional um, traumas as having to do with uh, political, historical issues. 
I, I don't see these as separate things. And one of the elements, and I think this is also something that I learned from the film, like um, how much these two conversations about like our family secrets and our national family secrets, these two conversations have something to do with each other. They somehow allow each other and um, they create certain kind of power relations in the family and certain um, like rules uh, of of uh, what who can speak and what can be spoken about and who knows and who doesn't know and who can bring up issues and who can't and i think th so you know there is the the question of injustice uh, but i'm not sure the trauma is only about that it's also about a story about believing yourself about trust and this is where validation comes to the point so even if justice is not returned even if we are not solving the problem there is still the question of knowing what happened and trusting yourself and being able to tell the story so for me this is a very important part of trauma uh, it's not just a side effect sometimes it's like it's the essence of trauma because when you are unable to know uh, when you're unable to believe yourself when you're unable to tell your story and to trust what you feel uh, it creates a detachment from the self you are in the uh, subjectified in a sense um, and this can be on a personal level on a and also on a political national level so you know, seeing something and growing up with this feeling of tension, with a feeling of something is uh, delicate. There is something that we have to walk around, something that we are not allowed to talk about, something that nobody wants to talk about. And, and no one is even talking about that, that we are not supposed to talk about it. So it's kind of, it's a certain form of gaslighting living inside these uh, ways of disavowal, uh, disavowal, the disavowal. It's, there is something uh, sick about it, there's something unhealthy. And I think that in this sense, the Nakba is also the trauma of Israelis, not only the trauma of Palestinians, because we are living inside the disavowal. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, maybe one of the definitions for me of trauma. And I recently was in a conference about uh, complex, complex trauma and someone said, the stronger, the, the bigger the trauma, the more validation is needed. Um, and I think this is really maybe one of the reason, uh, what my motivation of coming to my grandparents and asking them these questions, because there is a, a desire in me uh, as the grandchild uh, to have their validation and to somehow reach a, a shared view of reality to not be holding to the story by myself, but to kind of get their approval because it, it's not truth until other people are sharing it with you. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Um, just wanted to ask Sia uh, Tokosa, if you want to ask, uh, but you have written the questions you raised uh, yourself, or do you want me to read them? So probably. Um, oh, yeah. Hello. Um, hi, Prof. Um, uh, if you can clearly hear me, then I should probably just go ahead because um, there's some noise in the background right now. Should I go ahead? Uh, yes, please go ahead. We hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my, my question was basically coming from, um, cause I think I'm coming from a different uh, perspective when it comes to visual culture. Um, I recently uh, wrote a paper on, on how students um, experience what we term visual culture. And, and it seems to be like um, understood differently to what has been um, communicated today. 
So my very first question to both um, the, the pre presenters, the first two presenters was basically, um, how what makes that mirror a part of visual culture, visual memory? Because I, I wanted to, I wanted us to maybe explain how we arrived at that uh, determination that it was part of visual culture or memory um, as as communicated. But also um, in terms of just um, the answer, the response to that first question, the follow up question to Professor Ashman would have been um, would be, um, then at what point do we or what rubric do we use to determine if anything is sort of visual culture? Because to my understanding, visual culture would be something that is of meaning and is intentionally, let's say, uh, made or created so that that meaning is passed through, let's say, generation to generation or from one member of a particular sect to the other. So can we then say visual culture doesn't always have to be something that is intentionally made, but it can at some point if there is some um, conflict over it or some musings over what makes it that important to that sect or group of people, then it becomes visual culture. So is basically the meaning then uh, something that's not static, but rather it can change as um, time goes by. I think that's my question basically in summarized form. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you if, um if you could, could just, yeah. Yeah, can I uh, respond quickly? Well, um, when we talk about visual culture with respect to the mirror, I think we can, first of all, look at the mirror as a very specific item. It is an object, first of all, and in, as an object, it is visible. But then we also heard it is a metaphor, and then it is no longer visible. It is something to think about. It's a mystery. It's something that we have to... Uh, reckon with. And then it is a third thing. It has a certain quality as an object and that it is a relic. So it has a story. It's an object with a story that has to be discovered. So all these dimensions play into each other. And <clears throat> I wonder whether visual culture is the right term to encompass this, um, this whole uh, discourse. But it is important that it starts with something that is visual, that is visible, you know, which is which is the object in this context. Mm, if it's possible, can I also add a few remarks to Nadia's statement, um, which I found extremely <clears throat> inspiring, and um, your ideas and thoughts uh, go along the lines of, of uh, issues that I'm working on right now. And, and you have, in a way, fantastically reformulated them for me and also offered me concepts um, to deal with them. Um, my take on these uh, issues, and, and it's all about really Danielle's um, provocative film that um, it is, uh, the, all of this is about, is that I'm, I'm distinguishing right now between researched history and remembered history. I'm, I'm actually writing a book about the, starting with this researched history versus remembered history. First of all, there is a huge uh, misunderstanding and also quarrel conflict between historians and memorians, as you know. Um, but now <clears throat> what you say about the facts, um, first of all, of course, we cannot uh, forget about history when we talk about memory. We need to have access to the facts. They have to be researched. And uh, as you rightly say, it took a while until the 80s, uh, until the new historians actually did the work and researched it. And, and there is a, now an archive, and uh, this is also expanding. But the interesting thing is now that <clears throat> uh, researched history is not automatically turned into remembered history. And my thinking has gone very uh, <clears throat> far along this uh, question, how uh, does um, researched history become remembered history? Researched history, first of all, <clears throat> the archive has a lot of space, uh, whereas memory is highly selective, a very, very tiny space actually to get into, to make it into. And it is um, <clears throat> it has a lot to do with uh, the, um, um, th there's a, a guardian at the door that keeps the door shut. And that has to do with the self image. It's all about <clears throat> um, the self uh, 
fashioning and the self-image. I think this is the, the key to um, the, the possibility of creating narratives uh, that are more or less inclusive. And, um, and it is the self-image that rules over the uh, uh, possibility to uh, expand or to contract um, what is then ends up as remembered history uh, or is shaped in, in narratives. And now the question in order to, to go from one to the other, I, I see there is a broad intermediary space because I'm interested in the process and how this arises. And I think it is impossible to arise without um, public sphere, a public a discourse uh, where the media, where films like <laughs> Daniel's, but not just one film, uh, but many of them, you know, get discussed. And there is um, a collective enterprise involved here in talking about this, be it research, be it art, or art plays actually the leading role, I would argue, in, in this transformation and in making the public more sensitive and open to these topics. So there has to be this discussion going on and the media have to be part uh, of it and <clears throat> then eventually if it is uh, it, it really is taken up by the media and by the society then it the next step can uh, happen that it becomes part of the official narrative that it is uh, accepted um, uh, and enters school books and uh, becomes uh, really part of the a collective self-image. This is not impossible. This has happened in many places. One can tell the story, but it is there are also many places where you could say that it is not yet happening. I think there is a process in Germany, for instance, right now, uh, that we are knowing a lot about colonial history, but we are not, the historians have the whole archives, Every many books are published on it. History, uh, historians, uh, science knows everything, scholarship, Facts are there, but there is no uh, element of it um, accepted as uh, that this is our story. You know, this is exactly what turns uh, researched history into uh, remembered history. Make it part of your own story. Be part of this story and accept it. And this is exactly what uh, Disavowal has to do, uh, what is doing here. It's shutting the door against making myself part of that story. And uh, the, the validation is the opposite. Validation is um, the value of the story, the importance of the story, the relevance of the story, which is the opposite to dissociation and um, denial. So um, the, the whole point is that here, we are not only talking about facts when we talk about history, but also about emotions. And I think the emotions are regulating uh, in which <clears throat> Uh, frame, uh, the facts will reappear, whether they will stay in the archive, okay, nobody is bothered by the archive, you know, doesn't have any impact or import on the society because it doesn't um, <clears throat> uh, transform the collective self-image at all, it doesn't touch it even. Uh, you can live quietly <laughs> um, if you just deny it, uh, states of denial, and <clears throat> or dismiss it. Uh, but as soon as it is talked about, um, you get an unquiet situation because that is the first step towards transforming this knowledge into something that maybe really concerns us, that we can talk about as relating to us and so forth. This is the process um, that is, seems to be lacking here. Can I come in a few minutes? Because this conversation is so interesting to me. Um, yeah. First, Danielle, I love the way you actually talk about what a secret, like how we have to rethink secrets and what it means for something to be secret. I think that's incredibly important. And I, and I guess, at least within anthropology and close to, so, I mean, I think there's so much stuff that focuses on the state and, you know, uh, security states, et cetera, given the, not just Israel, but, but post 9-11 America, that I think that that intervention is really important. Um, and I, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one at all. And I think memory, you know, there's a complex relationship there between the sort of professional historian and sort of a public or remembering history. But, you know, the role of kind of certain kinds of emotional and affective commitments, even amongst, obviously, as you know, professional historians is complex. But I guess my question is, how does one make something part of one's story? 
I think disavowal is one way. I mean, what I'm describing, we know very well, but nevertheless, is one way of making something part of one's story, right? In other words, I don't think the only way of incorporating any kind of an event, whether it's the Nakba or, I don't know, you can think sort of America post 9-11 and the wars as part of one's story. I don't, I think one can, okay, so I think, I don't know how many people have read um, Ari Shavit's book, My Promised Land, which I think was trashed in many places, but incredibly well received and reviewed in the US, which says a lot about America. But, um, you know, he has this whole chapter on Lifta in 1948, where he basically, Lifta really stands at the center of the book. And it's all about not only were Palestinians expelled from Lifta, but there was a massacre in a mosque. And, you know, it's like this chapter that becomes really central. It's, it's the chapter that's most reviewed. And he very much, much makes Lifta part of his story. I mean, he says this book is very much of me coming, reckoning with what it means to be an Israeli Jew who inherits Lifta, which stands in for the Nakba, of course. It's part of his story, but it's a part he's willing to accept. In other words, it's a part that he says, I feel guilt the way the people who he interviewed who were part of the brigades that um, took part in the expulsion and uh, the massacre at, at Lifta, they feel guilty about what they did and what they witnessed. Um, but then there's this whole passage where he says, but I'm faced with this stark choice. I either stand with the brigade commanders who carried out the expulsion of Lifta and accept Zionism or I reject them and I reject Zionism and I will stand by the damned, right? So it is part of his story. It, I mean, and he's actually calling in that book for Israelis and American Jews, obviously, it's very addressed in that interior way to accept that this is what happened, that this is part of our founding story, but it's, but, but I can't walk away from the Jewish state for that reason. So it's almost like saying, so we aren't totally, like we're partly fallen from grace, It's but it doesn't change the story. So I completely agree with you on the, what does it mean to integrate these stories as part of oneself? But I think there are more, many more ways to do that integration. And I think we're at a political moment where there's a certain kind of liberal subject. And, and this way, Danielle, I think the trauma narrative is part of it, but I'm gonna say it in a more critical way, um, which is and not about you, but in general, I mean, I just finished this book on American militarism. That's a lot about soldier trauma and the, the figure of the soldier and what work it does ethically and politically. And in fact, the, the ability to feel and experience guilt and trauma stands in as an alibi for one being fully human in the way that one's enemy, presumably the terrorist is not. So I think there are all sorts of ways in which to incorporate in this instance, the Nakba into one's narrative about the self without it ending up politically where we might want it to end up. That's all I'm saying. So I agree with you. It's a much more complex story than I reduce it to. I mean, in terms of memory and history, but, but and actually I'm going to look at your work, but, but I'm a little less worried about where it lands us um, in terms of a kind of real ethical and political transformation of the world. And I just see this kind of repetition in various places around a certain kind of late liberal subject. Anyway. Danielle, do you want to just um, briefly respond to the question that I think uh, Sia yeah, just I left? Visual culture, I don't know so much how to, def to, to define or um, you know, to address that. I'm, I, I did want to, uh, I, I did want to, yeah, to comment about this question of why, why are we telling this story at all? And like, what's, what's the point of it? Because, uh, yeah, and I just to say that, um, 
I feel uh, obviously a lot of uh, despair and frustration about uh, the, the political situation. It doesn't feel like uh, the, I, I, I'm not, don't, uh, don't have any solutions. And I'm trying to imagine like uh, what would be a miraculous outcome for this conversation? Like how could we imagine this conversation to end up in the way that we would call, for example, political? Like uh, what, what, would, um, would, what would be a kind of like a optimal um, development in the, in the conversation? For me, I imagine that it would be my grandparents saying, for example, and it's just my uh, limited imagination, so please feel free to intervene. Like, yeah, you are right. We understand that there are more, there is more than one way to see this. And like maybe just understanding that their perspective is one perspective and that there exists other perspectives simultaneously. So for me, I, I'm saying this because I'm asking, okay, so would we only call political a response that uh, disregards the Jewish state and said, okay, now we've decided that uh, a Jewish state is unjustified, and that's, this is the only thing that we would call a political response. Or can we include the, still, like when I think about my family, for example, or my grandparents, if I am not imagining that they're going to stop being Zionist as part of this dialogue, but is it possible to, to have a political discussion with someone that is, still a Zionist and is going to remain Zionist by the end of the conversation. Um, yes, yeah, so for me, somehow it was more about just the simultaneity of different perspectives and uh, allowing them to be next to each other and not uh, by, by itself. Uh, because I can't imagine a situation that everybody is going to uh, to 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 change their perspective and just uh, want Palestinians to return. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So let me be really clear. First of all, I mean, I gave a version of this talk to a very different. I mean, a long talk. It wasn't this, but to so uh, the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS, and it was like it's a you know, I got the same. So what do you do? I'm not in any way saying one doesn't still want to do this kind of work, whether it's as a historian or a filmmaker, or, right? It's more that I'm trying to figure out, I, I guess I'm, a, and, and of course, what it, what it means to be, you know, engage in a political conversation is a much more complicated question. I think it's just that coming from, you know, a lot of the, you know, Said and, that, you know, that whole generation of people, there was a kind of faith. And I think this was true at anti -colonial, in anti-colonial movements that this would be what pre, what created the conditions of possibility for a revolution or for a successful anti-colonial struggle, whatever that looks like. Or to do allay this list, well, the question for me is more, does it translate into some form of repair or in some, in terms, some acknowledgement and demand that there needs to be repair, whatever repair looks like. That's the move I, I think that we've all had a certain kind of faith in and that I would like to still believe in, but. I, I see other things going on as well. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I totally uh, didn't just, just, it. Um, just a second, Daniel. Uh, oh. we, we, have, uh, we have both 15 minutes left and Reginald has a question and then you can, yeah, you can include it in this. Uh, Reginald, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, I can't turn on my video today, okay. uh, but... Um, I am fascinated by this discussion. Let me put some background to it. I see that there is the whole issue of visual culture. Then there is a whole issue of telling a story. Now, when you tell a story, you're using words rather than, and you might have imagery, but you're expressing the imagery in words. And then there's a third word that keeps popping up, which is ideology. And again, ideology 
uh, perhaps is what links sight and sound because of, um, well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but the logos part has to do with words. The idea part, if you think of the platonic ideas, again, those ideas are actually accessed through the mind rather than through anything else. Now, for, for, for you to understand fully where I'm coming from, let me just add that I am totally blind. I hear about visual culture and it doesn't threaten me at all. As a student, I enjoyed having plants in my room because of the joy that people who are sighted could see them. But I am just very curious uh, to ask Daniel, uh, what do you see as the um, intersection between the visual and the audio? Uh, do you uh, think the visual, as you um, express it as visual culture, can by itself cover uh, the whole range of what you are covering? Or is it over highlighting one aspect? And of course, I have already declared my interest in the matter. So that makes life a little easy. Uh, because those of us who are blind live in a sighted world, by and large. But I'm very curious, have you uh, thought about uh, that intersection between the audio and the visual, especially because you also talk a lot about st uh, storytelling. Thank you very much. Uh, be before you respond, Daniel, um, I just want to also include my question in this, so we have time to end properly. Reginald is, is a philosopher at the University of Nairobi, and his book that we will be discussing is Africa Beyond Liberal Democracy, uh, his recent edited volume. Um, Actually, the, the, I, I just want to follow on the question that was raised and also Reginald's question is this, the title that I chose for the, for this, for the poster is Visual Culture and the Permission to Narrate. The Permission to Narrate is a title of a paper by Edward Said. So the permission to narrate according to Said and my reading of the text is to speak about the permission or to even come to this context where you have to think about the permission to narrate is to engage the question of democracy. So the question of democracy as was discussed by John Stuart Mill and advanced by Amartya Sen as a public conversation. Democracy as public conversation, right? So it is, um, it was this question now that uh, Nadia brought it up um, in, a, in a very powerful way. What does knowing, why does knowing matter when we know? I mean, what does it change? But here in this, in this context um, is um, what Elida spoke about. And I, I, of course, what all the three of you mentioned is the question of the secret, right? And um, the secret is also, as Daida said, is the question of democracy, totalitarianism, right? And in this case is when the public cannot have any form of conversation about those secrets with which they live and which they host in their homes, then we are entering this context of visual culture and this is where Derrida's actual, actual virtuality comes from. It's Derrida's, Jacques Derrida's term that I borrowed were his, his idea of disturbing the philosopher's commitment to the real and finding the truth in language. So how the virtual changes all that context and, and the whole philosophical I, imagination of um, um, dwelling in language as a way of knowing the world. And in this case of visual culture is what the film does to all those secrets. I'm sure there are thousands of other so-called objects, obviously, now we know that these are not objects, these are actually a system of knowledge that we host in our homes. It's a question of memory, right? And memory is a, is a system of knowledge. Of course, that can be debated. But that, that is, yeah, that is what I, I just wanted to clarify this, but also at, you know, what, what, what does it mean when, when really the permission of knowledge and democracies at issue um, 
in a context that that we have to that it is easier to to uh, a, a history that is easier to approach and discuss through films you know so if, if you could just share your ideas and and yeah we just end end with 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 your ideas daniel we can just, just start with you what what do you mean it's easier to share through films i didn't understand what you so mean. for example the mirror and what your grandparents and um, what your grandparents know and uh, what you had known as a child and uh, that that has been inaccessible to us for example and the film may brings that to all of us everywhere so we can just click and watch watch the conversation right so that conversation is not you know like you say your family did not watch the film right but but we can watch the film and know more about that family context so it's a question of this techno science in it what techno science does in in the case the whole production of a film is a is a techno scientific infrastructure. So this how uh, this how I am thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Nadia and Raida, any of you maybe want to answer? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. This one. Um, one a key or one clue which I would like to pick up again, it, it has to do with uh, um, um, Danielle's interest in visual culture, namely Israeli films and the use of Palestinian ruins. I think this is a terrifically interesting topic. And what I would like to um, bring into this question is uh, the concept of pastifying and pre presentifying. So you can, you can deal with facts um, and stories in two ways, either as something that is um, passed and over with, it, that is a closed story, or that is ongoing and is a present story. Now, um, the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman um, Empire, um, archeology, span uh, crusaders, all, all of this is historicizing um, <clears throat> events. Uh, they are very, they're, they're silent, they're dead, they're, <laughs> Um, they don't speak to the present. Uh, ruins, um, uh, there are no voices um, um, to be heard out of the ruins. Whereas the Nakba is, is totally different in, in its structure. It's an ongoing story. And it has a lot, uh, a, a huge similarity, I think, to the um, slavery history issue right now as it is being discussed in the US, namely that uh, this story is not really uh, ended formally <clears throat> and clearly ended. I mean, we have uh, seen the overthrow of statues. It took a long time um, <clears throat> for General Lee to finally uh, disappear. But um, the whole issue is that even if you um, de demolish or topple the stories, the narrative is not, uh, not touched at all. It can um, persevere. So the, the narrative behind these stories of white supremacy, for instance, can survive and be continued. And uh, it shows itself as an unfinished story, as an ongoing story, which ends in mass incarceration and, and other systemic problems of racism that continue. So I think this, um, this concept of an ongoing story um, is, is very important. Uh, and it would be really the, the um, the way how to frame it, if, it, if now the Nakba is framed as something that is over and is part of the past, uh, then it would take out of it um, the, the, um, the, the issue that has to be dealt with in the present, because it can be dealt with in the present because it is an ongoing story. So I think that would be a way of um, uh, uh, cutting this way of disavowal would be a way of recognition and would be a way of um, telling the story otherwise. Um, I, I want maybe to respond to these questions here about uh, visual culture. And I'll say that for me, um, visual cu culture, it, it's a question of the meaning of, of, of images and uh, this meaning is has to do with the stories uh, that we tell about these images so 
when, for example, I was working on my, uh, my research about the Palestinian ruins in Israeli film, no, in order to, to say what is the meaning of the ruins in the film, I, I needed to consider the reception of the film because also the meaning of these films can change and we can change, we can intervene also academically in the meaning of these films and now maybe read the film differently. I can interfere in the discussion, in the critical discussion, in the reception of the film and turn this film that was never considered a film that shows the uh, ruins of Palestine, Palestine ruins and, and change its meaning. Or maybe, for example, a film that is Israeli cult and today in the 70s, but today we watch it and we can see in it sexual harassment and something that we were not talking about in the 70s, but now we reread it again. So the the meaning of visual artifacts changes uh, together with the discourse about them. One of the things that was interesting for me was to read the critical reception of these films and to see how the critics were reading the films and to see how the critics, for example, were reading the ruins metaphorically and not talking about the historical meaning of the Nakba. So they saw a ruin, but it was like an image, a black hole. It had a metaphoric meanings, but it was not nothing to do with the population. So I think in this sense, the, the, the film, my film now deals is like with visual culture because we take the mirror and now we discuss what is the story of this mirror. And maybe to go back to the question why I felt it's such a cinematic image, because all this time that we are looking at the mirror and giving it meaning, it's looking back at us. And it's like um um yeah it's it's um it's it's not just an object somehow with the fact that it can look back at us and show us ourselves it 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 holds a certain kind of of it becomes an eye that is looking at us um it's not only us looking at it but it is looking back at us So maybe, yeah, it's maybe it's not only what is the meaning of the mirror, but it's also what is the meaning of us uh, and the way we uh, and our look at the mirror. Nadia, would you? I, I could just say a few, I mean, I don't really work on visual culture, but I'd say a few. I mean, what really strikes me as you guys are talking, but also in general, you know, both you talked about the, the your MA thesis about the presence of these ruins in these films is, you know, um, I can't remember what a, a philosopher who talks about all human, I think it's Anscombe, all human actions are action that's under description, right? So he has this, well, Geertz's, Clifford Geertz's famous thing is, is it, a, you know, you see someone's eye move, is it a wink, is it a twitch, right? It's an action, but in sense of these objects are also all objects under description, right? To go back to the question of Derrida and language. Because if you think about, I mean, if I go all the way back to my first, Book, which was on archaeological practice in Israel, right, and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, right, all this architecture that gets sort of mimicked and remade, and even the stuff that's preserved in West Jerusalem, right, it's renamed traditional architecture. It's not named Arab architecture. It's not named, right? So the question of objects under description, I think, and the, your whole film is both about, I also think, obviously, one sees oneself through the mirror, right? Literally, filmically. But there's a whole context of what description we're going to attach to this object. Is it, is it, right? Both like, where does it come from? But is it an Arab mirror? I mean, it's not referred to that way, but also is it plundered? Is it theft? So I think it's also just thinking about the relationship between individual and both actions, but objects under description, um, which obviously sounds like what you do when you reread the earlier films, right? Around ruins. That's all I was going to say. Mm -hmm. If if no one has nothing to add, uh, a few minutes. If you yes, just just briefly. How are? How are? Do you hear me? 
sorry. Oh, sorry. It was unmute. My name is Howard and I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, uh, I just had a comment actually about Danielle, uh, how trauma, the Palestinian trauma is not only the Palestinian, but also it uh, enters the, um, the society, the Israeli society. I agree fully with you there. Uh, you know, one thing uh, I think became very obvious and wish that statement of yours uh, uh, make it clear is uh, the pandemic and the corona, you know, uh, how it started somewhere and then became a trauma of the whole world. But of course, when it comes to uh, Nakba or the Holocaust, you know, <clears throat> Uh, somehow borders and uh, different uh, political system and so on has kind of uh, made, uh, made it limited to that place, but it's not possible, you know, even trauma of uh, uh, a nation uh, travels psychologically. But then we need to, to know as much as possible about it, uh, to come as close to the trauma as possible. It's not possible only to know the word Nakba or Holocaust, to really or fully understand the, 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 the suffering of all those people who, who, who really did. So um, when we say Holocaust, it just becomes a word, you know, uh, and then we read about it, but it's not enough. And then we, read to, we need to read more, you know, Emre Kertes or, 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 or uh, Frankel or, or uh, Victor Frankel and so on, to really come as close to the trauma as possible. So when you talk about your film, you know, I have not seen it, but I definitely will because uh, this is what I work with, yeah? Uh, many people who are suffering from trauma and uh, we need access to, to as much possible information about the trauma to really uh, come as close to understand the trauma. It's not easy with, his words. Right now I am in Oslo and we have the Nobel Peace Center, but it's so far from Nakba and it's so far from Holocaust. It's not because we don't have access to education here, but that education is not enough. You know, they tell us uh, about the Holocaust or, or maybe Nakba even, but we need to come as close to the trauma as possible to be able at least to understand it, but we will never be able to experience it as the people who have done it. So what politicians has done, I am not a politician and I take the risk to, to, to say something about it. When they start to, to define it uh, and give it a word and so on, they make it a political uh, question but that political question will never be able to translate the trauma for the people. I believe your film is really, really important. And I understand that you feel despair, but I, I, I can say that despair is not despair in the sense of being despair, but another uh, source of power to go forward. You know, it makes you curious to find more, to come close to that trauma, to fully understand it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, that was it. Uh, um, I just want to thank you, Daniel, uh, Professor Asman, Professor Abulaj. Thank you so much for making time and, and being here. So this, um, uh, this video will be shared with other people who have registered but not been able to attend, but I will send you an email. And if you would agree, then we will circulate the, the video at, at a later stage. But the video will not be made available on YouTube or anywhere else. So just wanted to thank you so much. Um, yeah, I hope that's enough. Thank you, Father, for the organi thank organization. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, thank, thank you and thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the film. And I think it has an ongoing, uh, it is an ongoing story and it will change things, hopefully. Uh, but it has to get more known and has to be uh, circulated. More. Yes, thank you, Danielle, for the film and for also for inviting me and for everybody. It was a great session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.
<laughs> Bye, Daniel.